We talked about forgiving fathers last Sunday, and uh, some people came to me. So today is um, Mother's Day. So are you going to talk about forgiving mothers? Uh, no, I'm not <laughs> going to. I'm not going to talk about forgiving our mothers on Mother's Day. We should be talking about honoring our mothers on Mother's Day. Amen? Uh, so please, today is an opportunity to uh, go to your mothers and uh, give them gifts and, and buy them dinner or lunch and give them allowance. Uh, just uh, show your appreciation to your mothers and also your fathers as well. And if they live a far distance, uh, give them call, uh, cacao them or email them, or Facebook them, whatever you can do. Really uh, uh, pour out your love for them because... Because our mothers are here, we are here. Uh, God, through them, uh, gave us life. And because we had to receive first the earthly life to receive eternal life through His Son, Jesus Christ. So uh, God commanded us to honor our fathers and mothers. So we need to continually honor our mothers. Amen? And also there comes with a He's a promise and He's a blessing. When we honor our fathers and honor our mothers, then we will have a long life in this earth and also prosperity. And it is included in Ten Commandments. That's why it's so important. Uh, without honoring, knowing to honor our parents, it's impossible to honor our eternal Father uh, who is God. Amen? Ladies, did I do a good job? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so salami. Okay. Okay, let's turn our Bible to Psalm 103, verse 8 through 12. Psalm 103, verse 8 through 12. It's so important to forgive others because it's inevitable as we lead this life. Because we are in communities and we build relationships and we are imperfect and we are sinful. So we are bounded to hurt each other. And also, it's so important that before we begin to love one another, we first must forgive their shortcomings, their fault, and their wrongdoings. So it's important to forgive others. And also, in many, many relationships, our relationships with our Father is very important, and we need to forgive our fathers because they are imperfect as well. So to perfectly fulfill the roles of the Father, there has not been a Father who fulfilled perfectly the roles of the Father. So we need to continually forgive our fathers. And also, along with forgiving other relationships, it's very important for us to forgive ourselves. Forgiving self is very important. When God says, I have forgiven you, and also I have given you and sacrificed my own son to forgive your sin, when God says that, oftentimes, and many times we find people, us, not forgiving ourselves. Not forgiving our failures, our mistakes, and our wrongdoings, and our sins, and our transgressions that we have done to other people. We hold a grudge against our own selves, and we are overwhelmed by guilt, and condemnation, and accusation. And we cannot go forward with our life when God said, your sins are forgiven. So it's very important to forgive ourselves, to forgive myself. So we want to take a look at the passage from Psalm 103. This is written by King David. We know his life. There has not been a single person who has his life explicitly revealed and publicly revealed, so openly revealed to other people than King David. We have a Moses, we have a Joshua, we have a Daniel, we have a Peter and Paul and so forth. But David, his private life 
has been so revealed to us in the Bible. In the psalm, he reveals his emotion, his agony, his suffering, and also his triumphant praises before God. And also through 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, 1 Kings and 1 Chronicles, we see his life revealed, his sinfulness, his mistake, his sexual adultery, and in his private family, his son committing adultery, even raping his daughter. And then because of that, another son will kill that son. And also he himself committing adultery with a, a wife in his neighborhood. And because of that, he himself committed a murder, one of his faithful servants. And all these openly, without any secret, Hiding as revealed. Talking about transparency. But as we know that about all, in the midst of all these uh, sins and iniquities and trials and sufferings going on, he triumphed over all these. And he became man after God's own heart. And there is something that we can learn from him. Among many, many things that we can admire and there are greatness of David, but one thing that we can learn from him is that he learned to forgive himself. Among so many sins and shortcomings that he had in his life, he learned to forgive his, himself. He learned to receive God's forgiveness, and he learned to receive his mercy and his grace. And one of the Psalms 103, we want to read, how he confesses God's mercifulness. And from here, there's something we can learn so that we can exercise in forgiving ourselves. So let's turn our Bible to Psalm 103, verse 8 through 12. This is a confession of David. Let's alternate. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. In his confession, especially in verse 12, as he praises God's Mercy that his wrath will not endure forever. He pardons and he forgives our sins. And not only he forgives our sins, he says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. He also has the ability and power to forget our shortcomings. He has ability to forget our sins and our trespasses. Not only he forgives our sins, but he forgets our sins. And knowing this, that we can enjoy freedom and liberty. Not only we ought to forgive others and our fathers and mothers and all other relationships, but we also ought to forgive our sins as well. So often, because our conscience condemns us, and we linger with a guilty feeling and as if we are righteous enough to condemn us because we cannot forgive our sins. When God said, through my son, my blood, the blood of Jesus has forgiven and wiped away all our sins, but still we linger over condemnation and guilty feeling. And because of that, we may continually make Decisions that are detrimental to our life. Talking about the story of David, his life has been so revealed from to the people, and we know ins and outs of his life. Again, he committed a adultery, he committed a murder, and also when we take our Bible to First Chronicle chapter 21, there's another grief, grievous sin he has committed that impacted his nation. If 
average person cannot bear the burden, the guilty feeling, the condemnation that he can go on for the rest of his life. But for some reason, he was able to overcome that. The story goes like this. One day, as he was a king, his heart was puffed up. He became prideful. The law explicitly commands the kings not to count the number of the people. In other words, not like other nations, you should not have a census. You should not number your people. Why? The king should rely upon God alone. So you should not acquire many horses. You should not acquire many gold and silver. And you should not acquire many wives. And you should not elevate yourself above your brothers. And that was from the law. And King David, because he meditated God's words day and night, and he said, his word is sweeter than honey unto my soul. He knew that. Even knowing that, his heart was puffed up because he wanted to find out. So how many people do I have? Just like many, many pastors, after Sunday is over, send me attendance. How many people showed up? Today and the number increases. See how wonderful pastor I am. We can fall into that tra trap. But anyway, he fell into that trap. So he called his general, Joab. Why don't you go around our nation and number the population? And Joab, knowing also God's law, and in pleaded with the king, King, you have all these people who are subject to you and faithful. Why would you do that? Please don't. But he was a stubborn. His pride gripped him and he said, Go. And Joab had to obey him and went out throughout the nation and brought the number to King David. And God was angry with this. This was a sin that displeased God. And God sent a prophet, Gad, to King David. I'll give you three options as I punish you and your nation. You can choose one out of three. One, would you be chased by your enemies? Second, would I allow plague upon your nation? Third, I can give you pestilence. And I believe it was only for three days. So King David chose a third option, allowing God to punish him and his nation with a pestilence. And because of this pestilence, seven people died. No, it was not seven. It was not even 70 people died. It was not even 7,000 people died. It ended up dying of 70,000 people. Because a king committed a sin, against God, it ended up having 70,000 people died. What kind of guilt feeling do you think David will bear? It will be so difficult. If it happened to me because I made a certain mistake, because of my decision, because of my personal sin, let's say, hypothetically, among our congregation, Seven people got hurt or diseased because that sin is so grievous, that guilty feeling, probably I will have to confess before you, I must resign. But King David did not resign. He continued on. What made him that he was able to overcome from such guilt and such accusation and condemnation of self that not only he received God's forgiveness, but he was able to forgive himself. All of us in this room have committed a sin. Has your sin impacted your family? Yes. Has your sin impacted your friends? Maybe. And your teachers, your pastor, your ministry, and your job or your workplace? Maybe. But... Has your sin impacted and ended up having 70,000 people died? No. No. But if David was able to forgive himself of that sin, all of us here, no matter how great our sin was, 
we are able to forgive ourselves. And that no matter how great our sin is, the blood of Jesus is all-powerful, and the blood can wipe away our sin and cleanse our sins so that we can enjoy our freedom and we can go on with our life. Amen? I don't know if you uh, updated with the news. A few weeks ago in Korea, the ship that was going to the most famous resort island, Jeju Island, inside there were many, many high school students because in Korea, the high schoolers, they take annual trip to someplace else for two nights and three, di- three days and so forth. And from this particular high school, they were going down to Jeju Island and that ship made a sharp turn and the ship turned over and sank and it ended up having almost 300 people die. And because of that, the nation, Korea, for the last few weeks has been upside down. Accusation, condemnation of the, the ship owner, the school principal, the vice, vice pres, principal of that high school committed a suicide, and all these media and public condemning each other, and even some people uh, condemning the president that she should resign. Why is it? I'm not minimizing the number of the laws. And as I read the newspaper, such devastation. And I myself became angry over the way they handled the situation. The rescue was so slow, and, and these innocent young kids were perished in the sea and so forth. Even with these occasion, yes, widely so, people accuse and condemn, become angry. But King David, 70,000 people perished. Imagine that your father died, your mother died, and your children died, and your friends died, and people in your neighborhood died because of the king's sin. Talking about an enormous accusation and condemnation, how can you survive? But he survived, and he went on. And we want to know how the King David was able to arise from this guilt and go on, and he became a man after God's own heart. Among many, many greatness of King David, I believe, personally, I want to learn from him that he himself was able to forgive. And as we try to forgive ourselves, what are, what are the things that hinders us to forgive ourselves? What are the obstacles of forgiving self? There are three obstacles that we can think of. First is my conscience. Whether, even though my conscience, because of sin, is not perfect, it's not always accurate, but my conscience knows what's right and what's wrong. So when I commit wrong, so when I commit sin, my conscience knows that and brings me guilt upon my soul and condemns me. That was wrong. That was a sin and that was a trespass and so forth. And because of my conscience, it's difficult for me to forgive myself. And second obstacle is the devil, the Satan. In the book of Revelation, it says in chapter 12, verse 10, it says, Satan is an accuser, and it goes like this. Book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 10. (laughs) Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser, the devil, the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. This accuser, devil, day and night accuses us. He's looking for occasion to accuse us. So when we make a mistake, when we fail, when we commit sin, this devil will come to my mind and my heart and day and night restlessly accuses me. And with that accusation, it's difficult for us to forgive 
ourselves. And thirdly, thirdly, the reason why it's difficult for us to forgive ourselves is because other people. The people are hindrance. Why? People faithfully remind us of our failure and our sin by having stunned look at us. Look at that brother. Look at that sister. You know what he has done? You know what she has done previously and things like that? Behind our back, they gossip, they criticize us and things like that. So they don't forget. They constantly and faithfully remind us of our failure and our sin. And that's why it, it becomes difficult for us to forgive ourselves. But remember book of John chapter 8? When a woman who was caught in the very act of adultery was brought by many, many people. And according to law, the priests and the religious leaders and all the people wanted a stone and kill her. And she was brought before Jesus because they wanted to test Jesus. But we know the story as she, he knelt and he was writing something on the ground. But twice, then he rose up and all the people from beginning, older ones, one by one, left the sin and there was no one. And then Jesus said to the woman, when Jesus had raised himself up, and saw no one but the woman. He said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. No one able, was able to condemn her or accuse her. Other people were not able to condemn her. Even Jesus himself said, I don't condemn you. We speculate, what was he writing on the ground? My two speculation is, first, he might be writing the law. God said this, not to lie, not to steal, or all these laws are writing, and people looking down the ground, and he's writing the law, and everyone is pierced in his or her heart because they know they broke that law and this law and so forth. Or maybe because he's a omniscient, he knows everyone inside out and their sins, maybe he was riding on the ground. Shine, a couple of days ago, you did this and that. Daniel, three days ago, what did you say to your wife? And so forth. <laughs> so everybody looking down the ground, Jesus pointing out every single sinful act of these people, and they were not able to be there and stone her to death. So everyone, flee. We need to wait until we go to heaven to really find out what he has written. But I will not be surprised if it can be one of them or both of them. But anyways, so we should be freed from the eyes of the people as they can remember and accuse us and their rebuke is a correct one, we can humbly embrace it and correct ourselves. If their rebuke or accusation is wrong and it's unrightful, then we can just reject it and still love them and go on with our life. But however, because my conscience, because devil's constant accusation, and because people remind us of our mistakes and sins, it becomes difficult. But still, we need to move on. So how do we forgive ourselves? How can I forgive myself when I commit sin, when I linger over this guilt feeling? First, I need to utterly repent of my sin. I need to come before God and completely acknowledge of my sin and take a full responsibility of my action and my sin and confess before God. Because we have this promise, our God is faithful and just. When we confess our sin, that He will not only forgive our sins, but will erase all our unrighteousness, will be cleansed from all our unrighteousness. As if we are to confess, 
and repent of our sin. Oftentimes, we wrestle, we strive with our God because we want to defend ourselves. Oh, you know that mistake? That's because he or she was there and urging me or provoking me to anger. We come up with excuses and saying and blaming other people and blaming circumstances and trying to defend ourselves. David took full responsibility of his sin. He did not blame General Joab, called him, why didn't you persuade me? Why didn't you give up insisting? I sinned. Look at what happened to this nation. No, he didn't blame other people. He took it to his own and brought it before God and utterly repented of his sin and his mistake. That is invitation of God's forgiveness fully manifest in our life. There was a, a Canadian man. He was not a believer. He grew up in a family that was so poor and difficult and abusive childhood he experienced. But he wanted to be successful in his life. And he wanted to become a rich man. And he did bring some success into his life. And he got married. And he had a child, his son. And he had a dream of having this sports car, top-notch sports car. And he bought this. And one day at home, he would hear some squeaking sound from his garage. And he went there. And he became furious. Why? Because his three or four years old son would grab a nail and scratch his sports car. Instantly, because he was so angry, he grabbed one of the tools and slammed upon her son's hand. And immediately, they had to take him to the hospital. And that ended up his son being cut off, hand being cut off. The son weeping and crying and begging to his dad, Dad, Daddy, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. The dad being miserable, miserable. Because of that car, I ended up having my son's hand be cut off. So laden with the guilt, he came home. But later, he committed a suicide. Why? Because he went back to garage again to look at his car. And in his car, there was a graffiti by his son. And the letters said, Daddy, I love you. Overwhelmed by guilt, he ended up killing himself. Why? Because he was so consumed by himself. He was so preoccupied with himself. There is no available forgiveness. That guilt may be lifted up. But the decision, further decisions that he made was more detrimental, not only to his life, but to his family. Imagine his son have to live with that for the rest of his life. I pray the son finds Jesus in his life. Because unforgiving, Unforgiveness of self down inside is so self-centered. It's so consumed with the self. This King David, if he was consumed with his self, he would tell his people, I don't deserve to be your king. I resign. That's a minimum level of punishing himself. But he wasn't. Why? Because his life was completely thrown into God. Because he cannot think of himself apart and separate from God. Because when we do not forgive ourselves, because then the moment that I am condemning myself, I am completely separate from God. I don't care about his mercy, his grace, his forgiving power. I am all focused with myself and self-centered. And there's this great selfishness and preoccupied with the self. If I try to 
evaluate myself and trying to find the worthiness of me apart from God, there is nothing. We will only end up with a condemnation, rightly so. We deserve condemnation and punishment and hell apart from God. But when we throw our life completely to God, then humbly receive His grace, His mercy and forgiveness and find myself, then suddenly I realize my worthiness is like Jesus. Because I am so worthy, I am so valuable that God decided to replace my death with the life of Jesus. That much I am expensive. I am so expensive, the blood of Jesus, it takes the blood of Jesus to buy me back. That much I am valuable. But Satan knows and we can be deceived and consumed with the self, unforgiving self and preoccupied with itself. And we think that I deserve that punishment by me condemning myself. And I think, and I deceive myself, this is a righteous act. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. We bring it to the cross, and we don't strive with God. We don't wrestle with God. We humbly take a full responsibility and confess of our sin. And secondly, how do we receive, how do we forgive ourselves? Is that even though when I repent, the guilt feeling may not subside immediately, that I need to receive it by faith. He promised me he has forgiven my sin, and I take it and I receive it by faith. And thirdly, I receive and I acknowledge the damage that has been done. Sometimes after we sin, we see there are wounds and hurts and damage were done in our life or in the lives of other people. Sometimes we cannot take it, we cannot receive it because it's hurtful, but we need to take it in, trusting because God can bring about goodness of situation we made an evil. All things work together for good. God is all-powerful. God is God of second chance. And we must trust His power and accept presently whatever damage and loss have occurred and accept it and move on with our life. David was really good at that. After he committed sexual adultery with Bathsheba and she was conceived with a child, and this son was born, but soon he became ill, was a point of a death. And David, not only he was repenting before God, but he was pleading with God and asking God to heal this son. He fasted, renting his clothes. But a few days later, he was reported by his servants because they were talking on the side, realized his son died. Then he will wash himself, put a new clothes, and command his servants to prepare a dining table. And then servants were not able to understand this. They're talking to each other. What's going on? When son was sick, he was grievous. He was repenting and he was fasting. And when his son died, he is having feast. What's going on? Then David's reply was, he cannot come back to me, but I can go to him later on. When he was still alive, that I can plead before God and intercede, but when he's already completely lost, what can I do? He got up and he moved on with his life. Because of our mistake, because of our failure, because of our sin, we experience loss and we experience damages. Sometimes, but we become a slave to our past and we grieve over and we cannot move on. We cannot go on. That's not the will of God. David can condemn himself continually because the son was lost, but he went on. He went on. 
He acknowledged that loss, but also trusted mercy, the redemption of God, and moved on. And we must do likewise. And then, fourthly, that if needed, we need to go to other people and ask for forgiveness. I don't know about you, the Korean culture and Asian culture, it's a shame culture. But because of that, there is a certain uh, deception, thinking that when we commit sin, any sin, whether it's directly towards God or towards the people, it's a sin against God. So we need to repent before God himself. However, when we do wrongs to other people, we need to go to that person and ask for forgiveness and confess honestly, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Would you please forgive me? But sometimes we think, because I repented before God, that's okay with the people. It's his or her responsibility that that person needs to forgive me. Yes, you're right. Whether that person comes to me and asks for my forgiveness or not, I am bounded to forgive that person. Whether he's still repentant or not, it doesn't matter. I need to forgive that person. However, if I know that I have hurt that brother and sister with my own sin and trespass, I need to go to that person and ask for forgiveness. It becomes much, much easier for that person when he comes to me and asks for forgiveness. It helps that person to forgive. So let's exercise. Can we say to each other, I am sorry? Let's exercise. I am sorry I was wrong. Would you please forgive me? Especially husbands, say I am sorry <laughs> to your wives. <laughs> and lastly, we close it with a giving thanks unto the Lord, trusting his redemptive God, knowing he knows our fragility, our weakness, and our sinful nature. But he can redeem the circumstance and our sins and bring goodness into our life. Peter denied Jesus three times, even with a curse. But Peter became so bold after he was restored. He became true great witness of, of Jesus Christ. Apostle Paul was a persecuting church, bringing believers into prison. But because of his previous act, he became church planter. Everywhere he went, he was able to plant churches, numerous churches. Before, he was a killer of the church. But he gave so many births to new churches. That's how our God is. And Jesus, knowing explicit life of King David, to human eyes, he can be shameful man. We can be embarrassed of knowing that person. But Jesus was a proud to be called the son of David. He didn't mind to be called the son of David. Our God is a redeeming God. It's not God's will for us to continually condemn ourselves and judge ourselves and punish ourselves. When he said, your sins are forgiven, and also when you repent, your sins are even forgotten, then we receive his mercy with the humility. Let us all stand up. When we read the book of Leviticus, chapter 16, it explains about Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. It's only one day in a year, high priest can go into the Holy of Holies with the blood of the animal, with the incense in his hand, sprinkling upon the mercy seat and upon the veil, signifying God forgives by the blood of Jesus, 
the sins of the people. And along with these ordinances, there's one particular ordinance where you bring two goats, one you kill and sprinkle the blood of the goat. But another goat, the high priest will lay his hands upon the goat's head and ask a summon to take this goat outside the camp and bring him to the wilderness and send this scapegoat away. Signifying, not only God forgives our sins, but this sin goes away from us and never returns back. And it's forgotten. The sin we committed before God by the blood of Jesus, as the east is far away from west, it's gone. We can enjoy the power and freedom and mercy of God. And as we want to pray together, if there has been any sin or failure or mistake or decisions that you made have brought some damage to your life. If there are still such things, would you forgive yourself? Can we utterly repent before God and embrace His forgiveness and enjoy His freedom and go on with our life trusting His redemptive power? Let's pray that. Let's call the name of Jesus three times and pray. One, two, three. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Dear Father, we thank you so much.